The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Hitting the Benchmarks in MCRC, a precision medicine quality initiative for the care team. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RBK 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hey, everybody. My name is Dr. John Marshall. I'm a medical oncologist at Georgetown University. Focused my really entire career, now three decades long, on GI cancers and colorectal cancer in specific. And I'm really delighted that you're joining me today with this peer view, really quality initiative for uh, patients with colorectal cancer. And I hope it will be useful for you. We are really trying to hit the benchmarks in colorectal cancer. This is a precision medicine quality initiative for you and your entire care team. Our goals today are to learn about the importance of molecular profiling and the evaluation of tumor sidedness uh, within metastatic colorectal cancer based on current evidence, guideline recommendations, and an understanding of the mechanistic rationale. But we really also hope to improve your skills to formulate personalized metastatic colorectal cancer treatment plans using the novel targeted therapies driven by these molecular findings, but also not forgetting primary tumor localization as supported by our latest evidence and guideline recommendations, of course, using our team-based approach. So let's step back just a second. So where are we today? We know that we need to do molecular profiling virtually in every cancer that's out there, but we're not doing the best job we could. There's as many in some surveys, as high as 70% of patients who are not getting the proper molecular testing, the MSI, the RAS testing, BRAF, HER2, Intrac, et cetera. And we know this testing can be complicated. We know that most part, this fancier testing needs to be done with partner organizations because our internal pathologists don't do it as often or have all the technologies, et cetera, to do that, some of this testing. So we have to manage this. This has fallen back on us as the oncology team to make sure it's being done. So we need to do it, not only around the tumor, but also germline testing. We won't really touch much more on that issue of germline testing, but it is an important issue. But we also need to track the tumor sightedness. We understand that left-sided tumors are different than right-sided tumors. I'll go into the data that support that but it has an impact on what drugs we use and when. So we have to be really targeting that as well, noting that in our charts and applying that to our treatment options. So first line treatment. There's this real sort of attitude out there many of us have is that we gotta get started, right? We wanna go ahead and get going on treatment. We can wait on biomarker testing until later, but I'm hoping to convince you that you really wanna know that biomarker testing right from the beginning, as well as, of course, that tumor sidedness. And it not only plays in frontline therapy, it continues to play in second line and beyond. So just like in breast cancer, you know, ERPR, HER2, et cetera, we need to know RAS, BRAF, HER2, MSI in colorectal cancer patients. All right, let's use a case all the way through to kind of demonstrate what we're talking about here. In this case, is a 63-year-old guy named David. And unfortunately, he shows up with a newly diagnosed and unresectable metastatic colon cancer. His labs look okay, his performance status is perfect. But now he comes in and that's all you know, right? You've had scans, you have a biopsy, but what are you gonna do to evaluate and make decisions uh, for this patient about what treatment would be best? And we'll kind of dive into some of that uh, with David. So first, as we've been talking about, we need to know the genetic characteristics, the molecular characteristics. We pretty well got this MSI thing that's being done by immunohistochemistry, often by our own pathologist or the diagnosing pathologist right from the beginning. So we almost always have that right away, but if you don't, you need to make sure and get it done. But then the next are really gene tests can be done in your own shop, but you need to know RAS and the, all of the RAS, not just KRAS. You need to know NRAS as well. You need to know BRAF. This is the B, V600E mutation that you have to know. 
and you need to know HER2. Now, HER2 is, of course, also immunohistochemistry uh, with a reflex to fish, and that can be done, of course, in your own shop if you wish. So this really ought to be done right from the beginning so you can make your best initial treatment decision uh, for patients as well. And it has an impact on all sorts of different treatments that you have. So um, RAS and BRAF, for example, uh, they're going to tell you about what molecular targeted agents you have in play or not in play, because RAS, of course, predicts for resistance to EGFR. BRAF predicts for benefit from BRAF targeted agents uh, that you have to know. So having these allows you to sort of map out your initial treatment strategy uh, for your patients in front of you. So let's kind of remind us all of the story of how this KRAS story comes forward. And it really is focused around targeting the EGFR pathway. And I know you've all seen this pathway a thousand times. You probably even have it memorized on some level. Remember, the EGFR receptors are extracellular receptors. They dimerize. So EGFR is actually HER1. It can dimerize with HER2, HER3, HER4. So it's a dimerization process when the ligand binds. And then it signals through the MAP kinase pathway that you see here. And if you notice downstream, there's where you see the RAS pathway. You see other agents like MAC is in there. There are drugs that target all of these. And initially, with our monoclonal antibodies, we gave these drugs to everyone with colon cancers, tuximab and panitumumab because they all had EGFR receptors, and the thought was it would work if you had those. But it was only really after the fact that we figured out that if you had a mutated KRAS, if the patient's tumor had a mutated KRAS gene, the drugs really didn't work. Um, and it was really because you could block that receptor all you want, the wire on the inside was what was broken. It was still going to signal and fire, so the drug had no impact on those patients. But then when you separate it out, the patients who didn't have a RAS mutation, and remember this is a fairly high percentage of our patients who don't, then in fact your benefit got significantly better. So back to right patient, right drug, right time, uh, it worked better. So this was the beginning of precision medicine in GI cancers. And then a real odd thing happened. We actually started looking at where the tumor was. We all were taught that it's one organ. Do you ever think about left-sided breast cancer being different from right-sided breast cancer? No, it's all breast cancer. But colon cancer, it turns out, this is probably two and maybe three different organs from a molecular profile setting. We're, we're seeing this in bile duct cancers, right? Where the common bile duct and the gallbladder and the intrahepatic bile ducts are behaving different, uh, differently on a molecular level. Well, same is true with right-sided colon cancers and left. So we know that right-sided colon cancers have a worse prognosis. We know the left-sided cancers are better. We know that the, there's differences in where you find particular mutations. For example, almost all of the HER2 mutations are going to be over on the left side. Most of the BRAFs are on the right side, but there are some BRAFs on the left side as well. So we need to begin looking at this. And I have to give a real shout out to my good friend and colleague, Alan Vanuk, who was the lead of this clinical trial, the CALGB80405. And he himself went back through every patient's chart on the suspicion that right-sided cancers would respond differently to left-sided cancers when applying cetuximab. You remember this clinical trial? It was a comparison of cetuximab versus, bev versus bevacizumab. There was no RAS uh, enrichment at the beginning, at least. And we saw these really striking curves where if you began to sort by right and left, you saw dramatic differences in outcomes. So that sort of yellowish curve, the bottom one, is right-sided tumors that got cetuximab, whereas the blue one, the biggest difference on the other side, is the left-sided tumors that got cetuximab. So left-sided tumors, if you gave cetuximab compared to BEV, did better, whereas right-sided tumors, it went the other way if you gave cetuximab. So this was the first hint that, in fact, it mattered 
where the tumor was, that these were in fact two different organs that we needed to track. Then subsequent studies started to apply this the crystal study, probably one of the better examples of it, there have been others, of course, where again, the same phenomenon, that if you look at the top at progression-free survival, the bottom at overall survival, you can see that left-sided tumors there on the left did better, right-sided tumors, no benefit from the addition of cetuximab. And so this really sparks a change in how we do everything uh, with our patients with EGFR therapies, not only do we need to know the molecular characteristics, we now need to know the sidedness in order to apply these. Now, the same is true for BRAF. This comes on a little later. The mutation, as you remember, is V600E. It's the same one you're seeing in melanoma and other diseases. And of course, we have BRAF-targeted agents. At the beginning, this story was, well, BRAFs are just bad. And why do you want to even know? Because you can't do anything about it. Well, we do now know that more intensive chemo helps with so the full Fox Erie Bev kind of approach is a good idea if you have a V600E mutation right from the beginning. So knowing it first line matters. We have second line approved drugs for these patients. Um, bringing back cetuximab and penetumumab, even in right-sided, as long as you're also giving a BRAF targeted agent when the V600D mutation is in play. So we now know this matters in first and second line therapy. And HER2, clearly mattering in second and third line therapy, work going on in earlier lines of therapy to see how we bring these HER2 targeted agents forward. Now remember here, as I mentioned earlier, the testing is with immunohistochemistry, with a reflex to fish, just like you do already for breast cancer and other diseases only about 4%, and they're almost all over there on the left side. So I always like to tell patients and their docs, just when you're about to give somebody an EGFR targeted agent, they're left-sided, RAS wild type, they're BRAF wild type, make sure they're also HER2 negative, because HER2 also predicts for resistance to these agents. So you wanna know this from the beginning as well, particularly if you're one who likes to use EGFR targeting in frontline therapy. So you got to know all of these. Now, one that, as I mentioned earlier, everybody's caught on to pretty quickly is testing for immune-based therapies. And this really comes from groundbreaking work looking at the Lynch syndrome patients. Those four proteins that are listed there um, are the ones that are responsible for mismatch repair. And usually you're missing two of them because these two also dimerize, but sometimes on immunohistochemistry chemistry, you'll be missing one. You can acquire this problem. In other words, you don't have to blame your parents for it. You can just pick it up along the way, or it can be inherited. There are two different technologies for testing this. The most common that we see is immunohistochemistry. So our own pathologists are measuring those four proteins using immunohistochemistry. If two of them or one of them is absent, then you're very suspicious. This might be Lynch or acquired microsatellite instability. And I have to tell you, I often will do both tests. If MSI by IHC is detected, I want to still do the gene testing to confirm this. They really do slightly different things. And I have seen immunohistochemistry be wrong like the reagents are bad or something didn't quite right, work right. So I, whenever I see an IHC that doesn't quite fit the clinical scenario, I'll always kind of do the MSI gene reflexive testing. So for clinical trials, for a lot of the studies that we have done over the years, we do see that IHC and PCR are sort of equated. But in my opinion, I'm not quite so sure that they're the same. And I like to confirm one with the other. So how do you best test for your molecular abnormalities? Well, tissue-based testing is, in fact, the fundamental standard way to do this. Um, it's all of the technologies, the next-gen sequencing, all of that is based on peeling a little bit of tumor off of a glass slide and testing that. But we know that liquid biopsies are really useful in certain circumstances. So what you're going for here is the fact that cells die, they turn over, and believe it or not, DNA has a half-life in the blood of about three hours. 
And so the idea here is that if you happen to have a cell, a cancer cell, let's say, that died uh, within the last few hours and you do a blood test, you can pick up the DNA from that tumor in the blood. Now the tumor has to be shedding, it has to be that. So there's a lot of what ifs on this test, uh, but it can be incredibly useful for our patients um, because it's quick, the turnaround time is shorter, it's easier tests to do. So there are a lot of folks who are doing liquid biopsies and then confirming with tissue-based testing at a later time. So uh, which one you use depends on the patient in front of you, but I will say the standard still today is tissue-based testing. Now the principle here is that you've only got so many copies of the gene in the blood and so if it's not that many, maybe you miss it with your next gen sequencing as you go deeper and deeper, maybe you start to pick up variant alleles that are in the patient, you know, stuff because you're an old man like me, you've, your, your body's taken some wear and tear, you might have some mutations. So there is tumor informed blood testing that many people are using now because then, then you know what gene you're looking for, you can be much more specific and much more accurate. So this technology is also evolving quickly. Now, the big challenge for all of us in the healthcare field is ordering the test. This is a new process. Finding it in your electronic medical record, that's a big pain. But then also then communicating this information to your patients. And this is complicated stuff, right? And it's about which drugs you can take, which drugs you can't. Do you have some inherited problem or not? So we really do need to carve out time in clinic. We need to make sure our patients understand what's going on. There are a lot of folks who are building apps and you know, date information um, uh, sharing devices that you can use with your patients so that they understand better what these gene tests mean and how best to incorporate it as they go off to do their own uh, Googling and testing uh, or looking into what clinical trials might be out there, et cetera. Um, and in informing family members as well. So this is a thing that we have to really pause and think about and do the best we can to improve our communication with our patients. So let's shift over to our second focus, and that is how do we apply all of this data we just collected to our patients in their therapy? So I want to really drill down on some pretty interesting clinical trials, some very new, some a bit older, to give you a sense of where we are in this space today. And let's start with looking at frontline options. So we're back to our case. David, he's 63, as you remember, he looks good, his labs are good. His scan shows some retroperitoneal adenopathies, unresectable, he has a multidisciplinary uh, evaluation. His mutation status is wild type, meaning normal, so no RAS mutation, no BRAF mutation. Um, He's left-sided, right? So where that patient, we want to know is HER2, right? We want to make sure that's negative as well. And so this is one of those patients where you're thinking, is this a patient I could give frontline cetuximab to or, or panitumumab in that setting? But cetuximab is the standard agent that we use. And when you're making these decisions, you have to integrate really a lot. This is where, you know, chat GPT won't steal our jobs just yet because we have to integrate that patient's tumor burden, what is the biology of that? What are the mutational status of that patient's tumor? Basically, what drugs do I have to, at my disposal to use for that patient? And what's my goal? Tumor shrinkage, tumor maintenance, how aggressive do I need to be? Then I got to care, you know, bring in the patient's age, his performance status. How is the rest of him doing any other comorbidities? And of course, patient attitude in frontline is let's face it, they want to be cured. Their attitude somewhat changes over time. They still want to be cured, but they understand quality of life a year or two uh, in the future. And then you want to understand the toxicity profile, what barriers to access, that's the socioeconomic factors, frequency of visits to come see you, and they actually receive the therapy that you're receiving, and how important is their quality of life and risks uh, avoidance sort of behavior at this point. So you put all this together and make a recommendation for the patient in front of you. And look, you have a lot of choices on the menu. If you want to put your foot down, you can do all the way to a four-drug recipe, a full Firinox Bev. 
That's something I'm doing a lot of and say heavier tumor burden, BRAF mutations, um, or patients who just need tumor regression. Um, that has the best data uh, in the bank. But if you've got left-sided tumor and all wild type, you've got the EGFR therapies in play as well. Now, if you're not wanting to put your foot down on the pedal, you can go as simple as two drugs. Kate Beth, I have a bunch of patients, actually young patients, highly functional, small volume lung disease, where in fact, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just giving them some Cape and Bev. I got one guy who's two years in to Cape Bev, and he's still never seen Ox or Erie or some of these other drugs that we give in patients. So you don't have to give intensive induction therapy, but I would say it is the standard to do for most of our patients. And so with left-sided tumors having better prognosis than right, sightedness predicting for RAS, wild type, um, uh, you know, and the benefit to EGFR therapies, you know, you, you have to really make an argument why not giving EGFR therapies in the front line to patients with left-sided tumors. And of course, the biggest negative to these drugs is the rash that's associated with it. But the trade-off is the higher response rate, higher progression-free survival, et cetera. So let's twist this a bit. Let's say David comes in and we open his molecular profiling uh, analysis and we find out he's got an MSI high tumor. Maybe his immunohistochemistry is showing two missing proteins. Maybe we sent off for next gen and we're getting uh, a next gen positive uh, analysis uh, for MSI. So now we're knowing, and our intent are pretty good about this, that we that immunotherapy is in play. And this comes from this clinical trial. This is the keynote frontline study and it randomized patients who were MSI high to either single agent Pembro versus chemotherapy, traditional, say, Fulfox and Bev chemo. And you can see that initially, if you look over to the progression free survival curve, um, if you look over to the left, you see that chemo actually did pretty well at the beginning, and a fairly high per percentage of patients didn't respond to single agent immune therapy. And so we have to remember that. In metastatic disease, IO therapy is only helping about half of the patients with, I, with uh, metastatic colon, MSI high. But if you are one of those 50%, look at the tail on that curve. You're talking about three years out still being on just IO therapy. So you don't want to miss this opportunity, but you also need to remember and counsel your patients and not yourself be disappointed if in fact you determine that they're not um, responding initially to this treatment. So um, you want to you want to know MSI right from the beginning because of this these data. And then if you look at the overall survival, because you remember there's a lot of crossover here, you still had overall survival benefit in those patients who had the frontline Pembro with, if you look at that, the 13% of patients having a CR to the treatment. So we can't do that with chemotherapy. So you really want to make sure you get IO into these patients if they are MSI high frontline treatment. There are other studies that have confirmed this. Here's first line combination of nevo -Ipi. And you can see the response rate again, very high with a CR rate. It is likewise very high. So this is an option for those patients as well. And then Another clinical trial that is ongoing, looking at atezolizumab in frontline, either by itself or in combination with chemotherapy, and more to come uh, with this data as they mature uh, in the future going forward. So this is here to stay, and we're just trying to optimize what is the best way to do that. By combining it with chemo, we're sort of thinking we lose some of that early tail on that drop off on that curve. So we'll see how these studies uh, come out. All right, let's twist David's story again one more time and say that same setting, same unresectable metastatic disease, but now we open the molecular profiling and we say we get HER2 positivity or BRAF E600E mutation. What would we do with that? But I do want to show you the anchor clinical trial, which has been completed. It has a bunch of patients, almost 100 patients, looking at frontline therapy, um, combining Encarafenib, cetuximab, so encarafenib is the BRAF. Benimetinib is the MEK inhibitor. So a three-triplet combination targeted agent 
hitting that map kinase pathway in three different settings, showing some uh, benefit to patients. So you get a 47% PR rate here. You've got waterfall, uh, you've got um, uh, an analysis that basically shows no dominant subgroup of benefit one way or the other. So this clinical trial is suggestive of benefit in the front line and more studies are ongoing. The biggest one going on worldwide is called Breakwater. Um, this clinical trial has about completed its accrual. Um, so it, this will be the definitive go-no-go -no -go on whether incorporating BRAF targeting into frontline therapy will be the new standard of care. But until this reports out, uh, to me, it's still full Fox Erie Bev in frontline for V600D patients. So let's skip now to second line therapy and what things we know here. And I want to sort of maybe overwhelm you a bit with this um, NCCN. You've got options all over the radar, but this is where the molecular profiling really can help sort you into what do I want to do next in second line, third line, and beyond. And so you do have some recommended treatments for these different patients. If they're all wild type and left-sided and you haven't used your EGFR therapy yet, you certainly want to play that at this point. Um, if you already have used your EGFR therapy, then your, your BEV kind of treatment comes into play. For RAS mutations, you don't have that many alternatives, so you want to keep your BEV, your VEGF beyond progression. MSI, again, if you haven't played it, you want to play it. V600E, this is where your approval is. HER2, this is where your approval is. And then you've got your rare mutations of NTRAC and RAT and others, where you will, if you found one of those, I always like to joke and call those the Willy Wonka golden ticket. You opened up and found something that you weren't expecting at all. And that's going to really drive your decision making for those rare patients that that, uh, that you might find, but the others are not that rare, and you need to know how to manage those. So, let's look at this second line BRAF study. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a three arm study. It already had frontline chemotherapy, triplet targeted therapy, doublet targeted therapy versus standard chemo plus cetuximab. Big study, 600 patients all told. And what you saw is that whether it was doublet or triplet, you had essentially the same overall survival. This gets FDA approval for the doublet. Um, I've got patients on it right now because you do find these mutations. About 9% of all metastatic colon cancer has a V600E mutation. Both right side and left side can see it. Um, so you want to make sure you know about this to gain this overall survival benefit uh, in those patients with BRAF V600D. Now, HER2 may be a bit new on your radar, um, but it really comes to fore with this clinical trial done by my good friend, John Strickler, um, who basically started this out as an investigator-initiated study that said, but said, look, look, HER2 does happen in colon cancer. Let's find him and put him on this study combination of tucatinib and trastuzumab, single arm, phase two study. Everybody got these drugs. And what you saw is a very impressive waterfall plot of a response rate that you see here. Um, control of cancer in basically 65% of patients and in metastatic colon in second line, this is a big deal, right? Because there aren't that many things in second line and beyond that do this. So this was a real positive piece of data um, that, uh, in fact, um, has now established an FDA approval for our patients who are HER2 positive. We're not done there with HER2 because you all know from the breast cancer data, TDXD, trastuzumab, direct TCAN, had a very high positive impact in HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. And so well, what about HER2 positive colon cancer? Should we look at that as well? In fact, this was done in the Destiny CRC-01 clinical trial, and all of the patients got it if they were HER2 positive. And so here again, if you were three plus or ish positive, then your response rate was really dramatic as you see here. And so we do have sort of guideline approval at this point for HER2 positive colon cancer with this treatment in second or uh, beyond, second line or beyond. 
So let's get back to our case again at second line. So David's gone. Um, remember, he's our guy. He's got everything looks good. He had initially cetuximab plus Folfox because he was uh, the right kind of patient for that induction therapy. Eventually, of course, progresses on this. And what are you going to do next? Well, we talked earlier about VEGF beyond progression. Well, this guy's never even had VEGF at this point. But so, you know, you've got three drugs that are in play here. You've got good old bevacizumab, you've got a flibercept, and you've got ramucirumab, a drug we're using a lot in gastric cancer, but we can't forget also has a good role in colorectal cancer. And if you look at all of these studies in second line, they demonstrated an improvement in overall survival, even if you had had prior VEGF in frontline. And here's the RAYS clinical trial, which was ramucirumab plus minus, or full theory plus minus ramucirumab, sorry. And you can see the improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival um, when the VEGF was continued beyond. So this has clearly got to be a component through lines of therapy in our patients with metastatic colon. But it doesn't really end there because you may or may not know about this new drug called fruquitinib. It was just approved uh, actually uh, in uh, the fall of uh, 2023. And this was against placebo, two to one randomization. But you can see a very nice delta, an oral single agent VEGF inhibitor um, that actually uh, uh, won the day, if you will, with an improvement in overall and progression-free survival. So we have more VEGF tools in hand uh, beyond our IV ones that I just reviewed. Now, kind of giving Bev its term, this was a study called the Sunlight Clinical Trial, which was quite positive again of we already had TAS-102, trifluoridine tiprosil in play as a single agent, but this was TAS-102 plus or minus BEV based on an original phase two study, now a phase three randomized trial, which was positive, resulting in FDA approval here. So pretty much we're not giving TAS by itself anymore. We're giving it with VEGF inhibition, in this case, bevacizumab, based on the sunlight clinical trial. So each of these has shown added benefit uh, to our patients in subsequent lines of therapy. And not to be undone, here's ramucirumab plus TAS in the colorectal space. And this is a phase 2b study that's looking at seeing how this performs in this same scenario for our patients. So there are some other uh, second line and beyond options for those with MSI high. And I do on a high level want to review these. So the Keynote 164 was a study of pembrolizumab in patients who had previously been treated had an MSI uh, mismatch repair deficient cancer. And so if you look at subsequent lines, I think these patients had not had prior immunotherapy. You can see that it will work in subsequent lines uh, as well. But the more lines of therapy you had, the less well it tended to work. So then you look at Checkmate 142 Nevo Ipi and patients who are previously treated and you could show that the combination in subsequent lines was actually active for our patients who are MSI high. So you do have options through lines of therapy with MSI high tumors. And the most recent is Dostarlamab. And this is single agent response rate data, as you can see. Um, and it was approved in August 2021 for this patient population as well. So You've got frontline and subsequent line options for your MSI patients, different drugs, different settings, but you want to make sure and play at least one, if not more than one of these for patients who are MSI high met colorectal cancer. So I want to kind of wrap this up with a discussion around uh, really a, a kind of rare target in colorectal cancer, but one you might be familiar with uh, from your lung cancer experience. And this is the RAS G12C. So it no longer counts just to know they have a RAS mutation. You actually have to know which RAS mutation they have. And so when you see G12C, you want to say your antenna needs to go up that, wait, there's some therapies out there for patients in this space. 
And it really comes from the CRYSTAL-1 clinical trial. And this is adagrasib. And this was given either alone or with cetuximab. Now, in colon cancer, it's not enough to just hit the pathway once. We almost always have to hit the pathway twice to get good control over our cancers. And so this was a multi-armed study if you were G12C positive. And depending on what cancer you had, you then had different therapies to target so we could look at whether there was benefit or not. And if you looked at the colon cancer cohort, you can see very nice waterfall plots and a progression-free survival that is certainly respectable. So you want to know this. It doesn't mean, okay, I got a RAS mutation, I can't do anything. You want to say, well, I got a RAS mutation, which one, if it's G12C, you pull this off the deck as an option for your patients uh, in second and subsequent lines of therapy in combination uh, with cetuximab. And so this is in the responders. So if you were one of the responders, you can see the duration of treatment can be quite long. And those little arrows mean that the patient is still on treatment, ongoing treatment. So responders did do pretty well um, and continue to do well with this combination. So you don't want to miss this target uh, for your patients um, with uh, metastatic colon. Now, not to be alone, there's the drug sotorasib. And this was given with panitumumab, same patient population, G12C mutations. And you can see that this combination is also yielding a very nice response rate. Um, and um, so will also maybe one day be an option for our G12C mutated colon cancer patients. So stepping back again, I hope I've convinced you that you need to know your molecular profiling right from the beginning because you're going to sort patients into different treatment options depending on what that shows you. It's worth the wait. You can almost get all of these back in a week or two, depending on the different technologies you use. Many of these can be done in your own shop. The immunohistochemistries can be done in your own shop, or you can just partner strategically with somebody, some company, send it through your EMR, I hope, comes back to your EMR in a timely fashion. Your pathologists are engaged and are eager to send off the tumor to get this molecular testing, and then you can start treatment. A lot of us will sometimes say, forget it. I won't know it in time. I'm just going to start full fox bev and then maybe change in subsequent lines. I wouldn't really fault you there, um, but you want to make sure that you're not missing your MSIs, your HER2s, et cetera. Uh, but my real advice is try to know this from the beginning. If you have a RAS mutation that's not G12C, then really VEGF inhibition is what you've got through the lines of therapy, okay? So frontline BEV, second line BEV, or ramacirumab would certainly be legitimate. And then now we have fruquitinib and other uh, combinations beyond that. So you do have that line of, of, of approach. You've got new drugs to play in there and switch out here and there. Um, and this is about 45% of all the patients. Now, the next one is all wild types. So RAS wild type, BRAF wild type, HER2 negative, and MSS, so microsatellite stable, and left-sided. Here's your patient where EGFR drugs are in play. The data would say use them in first line, but you can also use them in second or third line if you so choose but you want to use the VEGF inhibitors are in play here as well. So you're kind of switching around and playing those drugs that way. The 9% of patients who get a V600E mutation, you really right now have frontline BEV as your biologic. This is a patient where I might give full Firinox BEV in that first line setting. Um, because of the aggressiveness, because of the need for a response rate in those patients. Currently, you have second line and carafenib BEV, um, or you could use that in third line if you so choose. I just will note that these are patients with more aggressive tumors, so don't save it too long, or you might not have a chance to use your targeted agent in these V600E mutations. We'll see what the frontline studies show, and maybe we move those forward. MSI high patients, you've got really IO therapy 
Pembro front line, Nevo Ippi second line, and other agents uh, throughout if you haven't used them. Um, and so you've got that to play. And you're going to want to play that probably early. Um, I've got some patients where we're doing combinations or starting with chemo and then shifting to IO as maintenance. There are all sorts of strategies you could use in that window. But don't forget, you also do have in the right setting otherwise, EGFR and BEV. Now, remember, a lot of the MSI highs also have BRAF V600E mutations. So in that case, you'd have both in play for your patients there. HER2 positive, remember, it's only about 4 or 5%. Left-sided tumors almost always. No current HER2 positive treatment for frontline, but you clearly got second-line options and third-line options for your HER2 positive patients. So these pathways sort according to the molecular profile that you have. And so you want to know early on and track it in your chart. So take home. You've got to have molecular testing for your patients. And here we're really focused on the unresectable metastatic tumor, sort of a different discussion all around about what biologics, et cetera, do you use in the patient that has resectable disease. Or none of these drugs, interestingly, is in play yet in the adjuvant setting. We're hoping that MSI targeting and, and possibly BRAF targeting may come to the adjuvant setting, but so far, no, just still the two chemo agents in the adjuvant setting. But in metastatic disease, um, we need to know. So get a decent biopsy. Remember, a lot of times all we've got with patients is that colonoscopic biopsy, maybe not enough to do this molecular testing. And so sometimes we're either doing blood-based testing or we are getting new biopsies in order to do the molecular testing. Get your metaport in, get your tumor sent off for profiling, do what you can in-house, partner externally otherwise, so that you can incorporate your decision-making even as early as frontline. Educate your patients around this. Make sure they understand what you've just done, what the results mean to them in their treatment, what the results mean to them and maybe their family and genetic testing uh, for inherited cancer syndromes, and then set the stage, if you will. And if you do this at the beginning, honestly, the entire relationship going forward is easier, uh, not only for you and the patient, but also between your staff uh, and the patient as well. So this is very important to make sure everybody in the circle, uh, the patient, the caregiver, and all of your team are clear about where we are with this patient based on the molecular profiling and the overall strategy going forward. So with that, I'd like to give it a wrap and hope this has been a useful review for you, um, maybe giving you some updates of new stuff you hadn't heard before, and hope that it gives you some nice uh, organization, if you will, of how to think about metastatic colon cancer and the new therapies that are in play targeting new RAS genes, G12C, we know about BRAF, we know about MSI, we now know about HER2, um, we know about how chemotherapy and novel VEGF therapies are in play. And so with this, I think you too uh, can fight a smarter war, a more effective war, a higher quality war against the cancer that is making your patient's lives less happy. You're going to make them a bit better. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash RBK860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.